Today I want to talk about rest in a world of unrest. We live, and I don't have to explain this, in a world that is so full of unrest. And all of us, I think, are a bit tired, wore out by the world in which we do live. And we can find ourselves just not able to enjoy much of anything because of all the unrest in the world. So when we think about rest, we might ask ourselves, how much rest and what kind of rest, if any, are we getting? And when we think about rest, we, we're thinking about here in the context today, rest is more than just a cessation of work. Because we all know that you can stop work and find that you're not getting much rest. You can think of rest in terms of sleep. As you get older, sometimes that may come and go, and you have problems. So it's more than that. So today I want to look at a scripture, at what Jesus had to say about rest, the kind of real rest that is promised to us by Jesus to his followers. And the scripture we want to look at and we want to examine is in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Now, we've talked about this, and we've mentioned this many times before. But hopefully there will be some things in here that might give us a better understanding of the kind of rest that Jesus wants his disciples to have. We, we will also come back and rehearse a little bit more of that in the sense that in my Bible, in the NIV that I'm reading from today, it has a caption here, rest for the weary. I don't know if any of you are ever weary, uh, but we tend to get a little bit that way. And it begins at verse 25. But we're going to move down to verse 28, and here's what Jesus says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In and of itself, it sounds simply enough, but when we begin to unpack this, we're going to see some things possibly that we have not seen before. Verse 28 shows us there, there are two needed areas of rest. Rest from labor. In fact, we sang at the uh, Santa Rosa congregation, um, all you saints who's from their labors rest, taken from Revelation. For all the saints who from their labors rest. So when we think about laboring and, and resting from that, uh, we t tend to think about the, the work that we might do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's more than that. And then he says also from heavy burdens. So we, we ask ourselves this question, do we have any heavy burdens? I think, well, I'm, I'm not carrying anything extra heavy, 50 pounds, you know, I, I can lift this burden to that. But that's not exactly what Jesus is talking about, just about carrying weights and the like. And then he goes on in the same verse. He starts out, come to me. And coming doesn't mean just revolve around the labor itself and the, 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 um, the weights that I've mentioned. And the fact that just coming to him in and of itself does not resolve the issue that we're talking about. And then thirdly in this scripture, it talks about he giving to us rest. It's, and it's more than a commodity that is given to us, but he gives it. So what are the things that we labor with and what are our burdens? Think about this for a moment. What are our labors and what are our burdens and how might Jesus help, it, help us? As I say, we talk about working a job eight hours a day. And, we, and what we are working on though most of the time. You have to ask yourself, what are you working on most of the time? Well, I would suggest that we're working on ourselves and we're working on others. Fortunately, some people have physical jobs in which they're able, I say fortunately, those that are doing it probably would not agree, but they have physical jobs that just totally occupy their time. 
someone was mentioning to me the other day about, oh, well, Pastor, you probably, when you work in your garden, you're able to just work and do those things, and you have kind of have free time. You have no idea how totally wrong that is. When I'm working in my garden, when I'm sitting in the back swing, or, you know, just enjoying my yard and the like, you are always on my mind. There is always somebody or something that is on my mind. Sometimes I have to kind of get away. My wife and I talk about this. We've got to get away from time to time to, to get our minds off of what we would, our normal routine. Now, not that you're a problem, but all of us have difficulties. All of us have children that we're concerned about or grandchildren that we're concerned about. And it, it is a, a labor of love. We want good things for them. We want them to have a good life. We want them to be healthy. So we're working on ourselves. Or, and in this regard, we're thinking, well, you know, I need to do this. And I, I need to be better here. And that's just kind of our makeup. And we're kind of pruning ourselves a little bit. But it's a lot easier to prune others than it is ourselves. I think we realize that. So when we're working on ourselves, we're working at chores, or we're workaholics. And some people are, tend to be a bit obsessive, and they might even wake up in the middle of the night and start working on things and doing mental gyrations. So when we think about the burdens that we, that we carry, because Jesus said, uh, come to me, all you are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. So what are the burdens that we carry? How about a, the burdens of a broken life? How about burdens of broken relationships? How about the burden of sin? How about the burdens of health and cares for others? How about the burden of finances? Do any of you have burdens of finances? How about the burden of the future? How about the... And also, and I'm going to put more emphasis on this today, the burdens of belief because there are burdens in beliefs. And, and now let me use the extreme. There are some people who have these wild, outlandish ideas. And their belief, and their belief system burdens them. It, it is a constant worry. People get so far out, they can be schizophrenic, they can have paranoia, they can be anxiety, they can be worried about everything. How many people on the face of the earth today, for example, are in, worried about the end of the world? Or the end of their finances? Or the end of their life? Or someone else? We're, we're busy and we're burdened down with this. So let's take a look at what Jesus had to say about that because I've entitled it Rest in, a, in an Unrestful World or in a World of Unrest. In Matthew 24, Jesus talked about and his disciples brought up the idea, and they, they, they brought up the idea of how certain things were. Because when you read Matthew chapter 24, it starts off with a, a certainty. So here we begin in Matthew 24, and this is just to talk about the unrest of the Jesus' world, with his disciples, and also with us. Jesus left the temple and walking away when the disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Now, that seems innocent enough, but here's a reality I think that we can draw from this. There is nothing in Israel more certain than the temple and the buildings. These are the things that they relied on that gave them peace, that gave them rest. We have the temple. It isn't the original temple, but we have the temple. We have these buildings. So they're, they're drawing Jesus' attention to those buildings. And they say, do you see these things, he asks. He, he says, I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, do you think this caused any unrest? Think about it in this regard. Washington, D.C. will be destroyed. Every stone, every building, New York, every you know high skyscraper... You think about the unrest that would cause in, in their lives and also in our lives as we think about it. 
So as Jesus, verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Now this shows their unrest, their unsettling. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? This is a world of curiosity. We need to know when this is going to happen. And the end of the age. That is what they wanted to know. And Jesus answers says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of war, but see that you're not alarmed. Or see that your heart is not to be troubled. You think about how unrestful that is? Well, we live in a world today where, unlike any other world, it is 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days, and multiple facets of news coming at you. Now, what's different than the man back in the 1800s that go out with his horse and plow, and he's plowing the field? you know what he's thinking about that day? One thing, plowing the field. Nothing else, unless he's maybe in bad country and, and afraid of a mountain lion or a bear or something like that. But that's the only thing that he's thinking about. And he might go to town and get a little bit of news or a newspaper, but it's not 3 o'clock in the morning. Or some people's phones go off with news alerts. This is happening. That's happening. You drive down the road. There's an amber alert there. There's another sign up there. It's just constant. You think, well, well, I just need to know. I just need to know. Well, that's exactly what Satan said in the garden. You need to know. And it created, in a world that was restful and peaceful, it created chaos. No. Now, I'm not saying be ignorant and dumb. I'm just talking about what what Jesus is helping us to understand about rest. So he talked about this here. But he says, don't let your heart be troubled. And you think, whoa, this is interesting. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes. Back then, are there famines? Are there earthquakes today? Is there, we'll throw in here, of course, Jesus didn't know about this. Climate change. We'll just throw that in for just another worry to be concerned about. In various, in various places, all these are the beginning of birth pains. This is just the beginning of it. So if I created some unrest in you or Jesus has created some unrest in you, let's come back to the original statement that Jesus, come to me, all you who are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. So we find here this example, Jesus talking about a world of unrest, the response to the disciples' questions. We also find another example, and I want to use this example of the rich young ruler, because this, was, this is a question of unrest when it comes to salvation. Remember Matthew chapter 19, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to give you a paraphrased version of it. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives a simple answer. Keep the commandments. They said, I've done all those things for my youth. I've kept them all. But then he, he prods Jesus more. And it's, in my way of thinking, it's kind of like, I want you to see how good I am, Jesus. So what more must I do? Because I can do it all. And Jesus said, go and sell everything you have. I reminded Mr. Dukat used to use this statement. There's only 18 inches difference between a pat in the back and a kick in the rear. That's, you know, such a swift change there. He was expecting, oh, yeah, I've done all these things. But when he touched on the real nerve center of, of his problem of sell everything, and it, it wasn't bad, sell everything and come and follow me. Come to me. And he couldn't do it. I think. And he went away sad. How did the disciples go away? Sad too. Because they follow that up with, wow, if this rich guy who has everything, who God has to be, have been blessing, 
who comes to Jesus, he had all the makings of being a star disciple, can't make it. What chance do we have? It created unrest in their life. And so they, and they say to Jesus, look, Jesus, we've forsaken it all to follow you. And how in the world are we going to make it? And Jesus said, don't worry about that. You, I will see you through this. And again, I will give you everything, a hundredfold and more. If they believe that, their unrest would have been taken care of. But I am doubting that they really believe, oh, we'll get that and a whole lot more. I hear you talking. But in terms of their unrest, I'm sure it was at least unsettling. So we had read from the book of Hebrews today about a group of people, the children of Israel, who went through the wilderness on a daily basis. God kept reassuring them. But this whole 40 years, they were a people of unrest. They were people who just could not get it together, as it were. They could not believe in God. And they were just wandering around, irritated by what God was doing. Now, for us today, we have to realize, when we think about work, what is our work? And our work, as defined in John chapter 6, verses 26 through 30, is to believe on Jesus, whom, whom God has sent. That is the work that we have been given to do. Now, is it easy to believe in Jesus? No, it's not. Not in the world that, as I was listening to some commentator talking about a physicist who's talking about, well, people who believe in God, they're, they're probably selling themselves short. Because we, you know, we've discovered molecules and so it, it, it doesn't give you the same sense as believing in God. And I'm thinking, well, it doesn't give me a whole lot of rest. And by the way, where'd you get them molecules in the first place? And where'd you get this, all the universe and how all these things happen? So let's go through here quickly, Matthew chapter 28. 11, rather, verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, first of all, come to me. Our rest, brethren, begins and ends with Jesus. And what does he say he does? He gives to us rest. It isn't like there's something that we can do, but rather that he gives us rest. Now, in order for us to understand and to fully appreciate it, I'd like to add a little support to this from the book of Hebrews. Because the author of Hebrews tells us this, beginning in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So we're not denying that whatsoever, that God spoke to prophets, the prophets spoke to the people, and in various ways. Sometimes there were... um, Visions that they had, epiphanies, sometimes their angels appeared to them. But, this big conjunction here, but, in these last days he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. That God, Jesus, made the universe. And then it says, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, we're very impressed by gravity, are we not? Gravity holds things together. I mean, Dave's always coming up with some kind of scientific adventure here at church and showing us, well, how does this work and how does that work? In the meantime, God's holding Dave together. Yeah, and and Dave's saying, and, and Dave's belief on God holding them together is getting a little shaky as he gets older and older and like. But God is holding us all together. And after he had provided purification, now this is important for us to understand in terms of unrest because how many of us are concerned about our sins? And if you're not concerned about your sins, how many of you are concerned about the sins of others? We're concerned. But when we understand that there is purification from sin, and what purification means and what Christ has done, it changes the, the unsettling effect, the, the unrest. It says, after provided purification for sins, 
He sat down to the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, the scripture that goes with that, of course, is Hebrews 4.14, that we have a high priest tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin, and that we come boldly before his throne of grace. So he became a much superior to the angels as the name that he inherited, inherited is superior to theirs. So this is the beginning of understanding who we're coming to. And our belief system in what he is capable of doing. So I want to kind of jump there from there to the therefore. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now remember we're talking about Jesus giving us rest. We're talking about his rest. Not just our rest because our rest may be and here's how people rest in our rest. We want to go to bed and go to sleep. Take a nap, get some rest. We want to take pills and numb ourselves out. We want to alcohol or we want to do drugs. We want to deceive ourselves and kind of say there's no problem, there's no difficulty. We do all kinds of things to give us rest. But it says here, we enter his rest, still stands. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us. What is the gospel? Good news preached to us. Just as they did. But the message they, this is speaking of Israel now, the message they heard was of no value to them. Because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. You hear this and you believe this and trust. Now, when we think about un getting rest, and let's use the example of the person back in Indiana this past week or week ago who won $435 million. Now, you talk about getting rest. You can just be cool all over the place. You know, I don't have any worries anymore and the like. Well, we know that on average, statistics show that there is no rest for the rich. Not in this case. I mean, you go from poverty to riches, you think that solve everything. But you know, you've got a lot of friends you never knew about. They look a whole lot like cockroaches coming out in the night and the dark and all that. And they're, can you help me out here? And I mean, there's just all kinds of problems beset people who, who come into sudden wealth. Now, again, it, it, you think, well, that'd just be great, but, but what if Jesus, you won the $435 million and Jesus says to you, give me the ticket and follow me. But, but Lord, give me the ticket <laughs> I, I, I think I saw George's hand go. <laughs> I think George just grabbed the hold of the ticket <laughs> and lost all color at the same time. Thank you, George. I just needed that support. That is better than any amen we could ever hear. And they, they, they didn't combine it with belief. They didn't trust God. Now we who have believed enter into that rest just as God has said. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. First, and then it goes on and talks about the seventh day, but it is about rest. The seventh day in and of itself does not give you or I rest. In and of itself. So we find here that Jesus tells us, in like in John 14, my peace, my joy, I give to you. And in that we find rest. So we begin with coming to Christ, resting in the... And here's what we rest. We rest in the work of Jesus. That is, we rest in His forgiveness. So, how forgiving is Jesus' forgiveness? It's complete. It's total. We rest in his redemption. 
that he has redeemed us. We rest in his reconciliation. We rest in his love. We rest in his acceptance. And we think about his acceptance. He knows who we are. He knows our past, our present, and he knows our future. And he's accepting of us. We rest in his faith. We trust in him. We rest in the hope, the grace, the comfort, the holiness. We rest in his friendship. You know, this is an invitation. Come to me and I'll give you rest. We also rest in a relationship that he has with the Father. We rest in that. Because till Jesus, we really didn't know that much about God. We didn't know him as Heavenly Father. Not in the way in which Jesus reveals him. And in this rest, I want to give you another point here because I mentioned to you this actually this breaks up a little bit under the subtitle of Rest for the Weary. So let's go back and see if this doesn't give us a little rest as well. In verse 25, At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed it unto little children. How many of you have a doctor's degree? How many of you have an IQ of 160? No, no, you've got more than 16. <laughs> Zero makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. The wise and learned. God, in his wisdom, Jesus said, hid it from the wise and the learned. That doesn't mean they can't learn. Just, you know, we got the example of the rich young ruler. He says, but he's revealed it unto little children. Now, I have, in the years in which I've done ministry, I've heard so many people say, well, I can't remember this scripture. I know it's there, but I don't know exactly where it is. And I can't remember this and, you know, all these things. And, well, I didn't, I got a GED or I, I didn't finish high school or, you know, I, all these things. Look, God calls little children. God calls. That ought to give us an encouragement that we can be his friends and his children. None of Jesus' disciples graduated from Harvard. Jesus didn't graduate from Harvard, Yale, or Cambridge. Oxford. Now, I'm not doing, saying that as a put-down, but as an encouragement and as a lift-up for all of us that God would choose us. And, be, and then, by the way, who is our professor? Who is our teacher? The smartest teacher, the smartest physicist in the entire universe, the smartest doctor, oh, the smartest and the best, what do they call those people that carve on your face and, no, the, uh, what, yeah, the surgeon, but, you know, that restructures your face. Plastic surgeon, yeah, 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 he doesn't use plastic. Anyway, last, I don't know why. See, I forgot. Anyway, he, he, because you see, he can change us and, and glorify us. This is who, the, the one who encourages us. And we rest in him. So we rest in Jesus. We rest in that relationship. He says, and then this is interesting in that same example. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. So again, Jesus is revealing the Father, and what we can be encouraged by, we do know the Father, and we come to Christ. So let's take a look at the, yoke, the tools of Jesus' rest. He says, take my yoke and learn of me. The proper tool that makes a difference in the in the work. So I got to take a moment and just a brief moment. Last week when I went to Modesto, oh, actually on Sunday for the uh, memorial service, I borrowed a paint contractor's airless sprayer, and I had just done the memorial service, and there was a lot of emotion there. Anyway, it, for me. Um, and for everybody in that regard. But anyway, we went out to the parking lot. We loaded. He said, oh, here it is. This is real simple. You turn this dial, and then you turn this dial, and flip this switch, and make sure you do that. So when I got home, I didn't remember a thing. 
Now, to really make me feel smarter, I went out there and it started to get the handle off. And it couldn't get the handle off. I mean, he put it on a bar, but how do you get it? It was like one of those things that Dave does where you unwrap it and all of that. I couldn't get the handle off. So I was beginning to feel dumb. And I'm thinking, I got this guy's $1,200 paint sprayer, and I can't even get the handle off. Then I got my five-gallon bucket of paint and couldn't get the lid off of the paint bucket. And of course, I, I, I wasn't reading that. I got to pull the seal around there that breaks off, and then I can do that. And then I'm looking at it and saying, well, now do I stick that, that, that rod down? Do I take the lid off and put that in? Or do I put it through that little hole and put it in it? I need to call him. I feel too dumb to call him. And then I begin to worry about it. I, I was laying awake at night thinking, now how, what I'm doing? Maybe I ought to just put it in a bucket. And, if I, and they said, well, you got this other bucket. You put it in here, and it'll get the overflow, and then you can paint this in and spray it out there. So in the night, I'm obsessing, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know what I did? We rolled the whole house. We left it set there, an easy tool to use, but I didn't have enough sense to know exactly how to do it. And I went and called to ask for help. So I got the paint thing in the back of my car and taking it back to him today, give it back. My wife and I and my son have been painting my house for two days with a roller and a paintbrush and a log extender on big ladders. Could have had it done probably in a few hours. Wrong tool. I mean, it was a good tool for the old way of doing things, but I had a new tool, but I didn't know how to use it. Jesus has a really good tool, his yoke. And a yoke is what couples us together. The, the, the Greek word is zukos. It means joined together. It's a, a beam of balance. If you want to have rest, hitch up your wagon with Jesus. And a yoke, the way I like to define yoke, and for any of those that ever plow with a mule or a horse or something like that, for, you fit it around the neck or a saddle, it's an instru instrument of mercy to do a hard job. Living life is not, in and of itself, easy. We can all attest that we've had our problems and things that just give us unrest, like a paint sprayer, which the contractor would have just laughed. I thought about calling Jim and saying, Jim, do you know anything about paint sprayers? But I did go over and ask my neighbor, do you know anything about paint sprayers? And he came over and and the two of us couldn't get the handle off. So I gave up on him. And we rolled. We rolled with the punches. So it's a coupling together. So in terms of rest, do we have any coupling together? Emmanuel. What is Emmanuel? God with us. Coupled together. God's spirit dwells with our spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It again explains and helps us to realize, wait, God is on our side. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We know the Father because Jesus reveals the Father. We know the Son. God's Spirit dwells in us. And then Jesus says, I am meek and lowly in heart. In a worldly world in which we live, work often brings arrogance of heart and unrest. A humble heart of Jesus gives us rest. It's But... Notice what it says. Jesus says there, rest for your souls. This is not psychology, but what, what we're talking about, what is inside of you? The confidence that we have in Christ, even at his coming? Why would we be so worried about the end of the world if Christ is coming and we're his friend? He laid down his life for us. He... he and he has done all of these things. Why should we be so unsettled when we have the hope of salvation that he's given to us? Rest for the inside, our soul, inside our heads, inside our, you know, our very being. Now, on the outside, we may be like the proverbial duck that's you know, kind of calm on the surface and paddling like mad underneath. But the point being for us is that we have rest and we have peace because of Christ. We come to him. So rest, what is rest? Well, rest is believing in Jesus, who he is, the work he has done, who we are in Christ. 
and that Christ gives us rest in a world of unrest. So I say to all of you, and this is not a dying statement, but rather a living statement, rest in peace, in the peace of Christ, to his glory and to his honor. Amen. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for your love, for the rest that you give to us. And as we come home to church each week, help us to enjoy the rest. And as, Father, we go about our business, help us to enjoy the rest that comes in Christ Jesus. That we not be weary, that we not be people of unbelief, but people who believe in you and the rest that you want us to have. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Feeling the blues today? Or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life? Or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.